Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian in Orlando, Florida, where we are covering the Air Force Association's annual Air Warfare Symposium. This year's topic, Command and Control and Fusion Warfare. And we have with us the commander of the Air Mobility Command, uh, General Dewey Everhart. Sir, thanks very much for joining us. Sir, thank you for allowing me to be here. A really great opportunity, so thank you. Uh, it's, it's great, and we were talking a little bit earlier that it's actually quite possible that 25 uh, years ago we may have met when you were at Charleston Air Force Base when the C-17 was coming into service and you were in the initial cadre and I was, was a reporter covering it coming into service. That's hard to believe and it's hard to believe that that major weapon system that we have that we're flying so hard is already almost 25 years old. I know. It's just unbelievable. It's, it's unbelievable and a requirement really for that airplane that started in, in uh, you know, an outgrowth of the Vietnam War and the Folder Gap and all of the things that we wanted to do. I want to get to equipment but what I wanted to do first is to talk a little bit about your priorities. Right now it looks sure. like we're likely in a positive budget environment. On the other hand, there are those who you know, question exactly what the contours of the increase will be. Uh, even the chief was a little bit unclear about exactly what this is going to mean. Obviously, the services have put their requests into uh, into uh, the the administration to to figure out what that budgetary increase looks like. But from your standpoint, if you had more money, where would you be putting that money? What are your top priorities? I'll tell you, if if I had the more money coming to me, then the, one of the first things was like, we put aircraft into backup aircraft inventory. We put eight C5Ms tremendous capability that could add on to our warfighter to bring up to a to million ton miles per day. If I could get those eight back at a BAI, that's one of my first priorities. The second priority I have is uh, completing a study on high value airborne assets. In other words, aircraft that's going to be persistent over the battlefield set to support our combat air forces to allow them to survive, to be able to return those airplanes, get them back up there. I'm talking about our tankers. AWACS, those types of aircraft that provide critical com uh, communication nodes, but also provide you know, persistent capability over the battlefield itself. And then the last thing, we talked about air our aircraft being 25 years old. We are flying our airplane hard. We truly are, and we're riding on the backs of our maintainers. But is there a way that we can continue our modernization programs to keep them in viable airspace to be able to support the combatant commander when they call upon us to be able to do forward basing? or adaptability or refueling at the moment's need where he needs it as quickly as possible. Those are the three things that I would get after. You also have a pilot shortage. Uh, it's about 315 pilots short. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you look at your manpower needs, how many, unf so first, how do you tackle the pilot issue and get folks into the community because obviously more have been leaving than anybody wants. This is an issue on the combat air forces side as well, but also, how many more people do you need to fill out the empty billets that you have as part of the chief's plan to make the Air Force more whole and get that force level to, the, to, to where it needs to be for the service to, to support the missions it has? Mm -hmm. Well, I tell you, the number of pilots I need to support the mission I have would be depending on the airframes that I have that's actually flying at the time, what's called upon in the O plans. So the 315 pilots, what am I doing right now to get after this national pilot issue? And I will tell you, it's just not only a pilot issue. When the economy gets good, it's what I call a blessing, which is great for America, but it's also a curse because that gives us competition from the military perspective, air traffic controllers, maintainers, uh, air medical evacuation, you name it, along with the pilots. So one of the things that General Goldfein has challenged me with is get with industry, work with industry, and let's come up with a common solution where we have a common product, pilots, where we're not competing against one another. How do we do that? And we want industry to be in the lead. Because oftentimes when I tell industry, I said, when it comes to the pilots that are getting out, the Air Mobility Command, you know, what I have is a contract that's basically 10 years in one day. And the majors will come back and say, we understand that, we're not too worried about it right now. I said, yes, but you will worry about it if the pilot shortage keeps going on. And then we continue to lose numbers because I've got to support combatant commanders. General Goldfein's got to support combatant commanders. So this problem, if there's a stop loss, you could have a problem that's going to not face you in two or three years. It could face you tomorrow. And so we're looking at things like, can we do a partner, uh, public partner uh, partnership, community partnerships, to do a such a thing as a university campus? Can we do debt forgiveness? And when I mean a university campus, I mean a campus that actually has simulators on it. So these kids, when they come out of school, they can work for the airline industry while going to the simulator and continue to build flying hours as they meet their air, you know, their air transport pilot certificates. 
that 1,500 hours. We're looking at various ways of can you come in and active duty, go to the Guard and Reserve, go to the airlines. Or go to the airlines, come on active duty, go to the Guard and Reserve. Or go to the Guard and Reserve, come on the airlines and go to active duty. Can we look at those combinations? And so we are working at the very eaches of this, but we are hand in hand with industry. We are wanting industry to leave from the front, and they are. Uh, they're working, and we're also going to meet with the, the chief on May 18th to sit down with industry. And this is all the majors, the regionals, plus the schoolhouses. And what I mean by the schoolhouses, the Emory Riddle, North Dakota, those people who are actually producing pilots, how do we get after this where it benefits both the military and the civilian side so we don't have that competition? This is a national resource. It truly is. This is how we go to war, and this is also how we support our GDP whether it's you're looking at it from the commercial mm -hmm. side or the military side. So we've got to work together in a collaborative way. What about on the shortfall? Uh, from your command's perspective, how many empty billets do you have that you have to fill just to make yourself whole, not necessarily without growing uh, necessarily, I mean, just, just to be able to execute the missions you have now? Yeah, right now, right now, I have the 315 short. I'm sitting okay. But I will tell you, in the next four years, I have 1,600 1,600 in the next four years that are eligible to separate. So just to maintain the status quo, it winds up being around, and I'll get the exact number to you, anywhere between you know 200 to 300, it could be up to 400 pilots, depending on the various scenarios that we're going on and depending on how many decide to exit. So it's just not, oh, you got 1,600, divide 1,600 by, by four, and you get to so many per, no, it, it doesn't work that way. The math just does not work that way. It, it varies from day to, from year to year. So we gotta, we, we constantly watch that, constantly update our models to make sure we're fitting the needs, just to be able to fly that lift that we have. And on the enlisted side, does that mean that you're in good shape? On our enlisted side, we, we are looking definitely at our maintainers. Because I would tell you, we, you cannot compete against the civilian market. You can't. What drives the people in the military, what makes us the greatest air power force is that it's the dedication to duty and the service to our nation. You can never take that away. But when they serve our nation or they get tired, then they're gonna, they may start looking for other courses of, of uh, opportunity for income. I can't compete against the, the, the airlines. I just can't. I can't compete against the industry. So, we are, yes, we're t definitely taking a look at our maintainers, particularly if I got a, a, an ATP, air transport, uh, you know, uh, propulsion certificate. Mm -hmm. When they get out and with that certificate, they can make a lot of money on the outside. That's very tempting to them. So we're doing things that we make sure that we reduce uh, potentially their ops tempo, make sure we're taking care of them, make sure they're resilient, make sure we have good leadership, making sure we're providing those needs for them. That's what, that's what we're doing. Uh, you have been flying the wings literally, almost literally, off of your airplane. I mean, I remember when KC-135R was a new thing, yes, that Pacer Greg was a new thing. These are old things now. Um, you know, again, you were talking also about the C-17, and really it's, it's an old airplane. It's phased from production at this point. Um, how are you going to stretch this out? Because if you look at the tanker replacement program, um, some, the KC-46 has had some delays. Mm -hmm. It looks like it's on track on the new revised schedule. But those airplanes are going to be coming in at a very, very slow rate, just slightly more than one a month. And you still have hundreds of KC-135s that you have to replace. How are you going to stretch the life of those airplanes out? And is the acquisition schedule too slow? Does that at some point, and I understand the Air Force has wanted to do this in a measured sort of paced way, but at some point do you have to consider accelerating the pace of those deliveries to be able to retire aging aircraft that are getting more costly by the year? Well, I would tell you, one of the things, I'm, that is a great question that we're getting af after right now, is called enterprise fleet management. And what that entails is taking a best practice out of industry and going, okay, we have aircraft that are located in this location, this location, and this location. So I have aircraft that are located in the Pacific. And we do inspection, we say, hey, aircraft located in the Pacific have a higher corrosion rate than what they would at a, at a Kona space location. So when they go into their depot met, maintenance and they come out, can we swap those locations around? Not a one-for-one -one swap, but in t the entire fleet. We've done the analytical work on that, and we're working collaboratively with the reserves and also with the guard 
and we're uh, working our, our fours, our logistics folks are coming together and saying, how can we logically do this to where it's acceptable for everyone? What we're finding out is that we can extend an aircraft, the C-17, from 30,000 hours to about 42,000 hours. That gives us budget maneuver space as we watch the budget. Where can we start a new acquisition program? It also gives a relief valve for the Air Force to go, yes, you can plug it there, and I can guarantee that it will be complete plugged there because you gave them maneuver space to do so. In the long run, it saves a life on the airplanes. It also reduces weapons system sustainment cost. That is huge benefit. So we're looking at the C-17 now. Then we're going to, we've already got baked into the KC-46. Then we're going to start looking at the 135. And then we're going to start looking at C-5, et cetera, et cetera. We want to be able to do this across the entire fleet. The other thing that we're wanting to do is that as we offboard data, uh, with the new requirements that are coming in 2020 with the ADSB out, uh, we can actually offboard data to do predictive maintenance and saying, hey, in about 20 hours, that motor needs to be changed out. Do you want to go to the motor changing facility now, or do you want to do it when it actually costs the motor? Well, let's do it now and take the motor off the wing, go and analyze that motor, get the better data off it, improve the motor, and then put the new one on and keep the airplane flying. That increases the longevity that increases the flexibility that we need as we bring on through the acquisition process. Is 15 airplanes roughly a year for the KC-46 enough? It's going to take us to 170 by out to 28, 2028. I still got 300 airplanes, KC-135s to replace. You're talking about airframes that are going to be, they could be up to 100 years old. But I will tell you, just because they're old doesn't mean that we don't do modernization. That doesn't mean we do carrying feeding. It may mean that we have to do more of it. So then we got talking about the maintainer shortfall, I'll watch that very carefully. So is it enough? We have to see what we have in our resources to be able to, can we accelerate it? Sure, I would love to accelerate it. But if I can't physically do so, 15 is the right number for that particular weapon buy. And then we're doing our studies to go, what does the next generation look like? What's the next tanker look like? What's the next airlifter look like? What is it capability that we need for it to bring to our nation's needs? And then when can we build that in based off the things we just talked about to give me maneuver space, to propose to the higher headquarters, this is where we want to start a new acquisition program. Well, so one of the one of the key questions on that is, you know, if you look at, uh, you know, I remember having this uh, conversation with General Selva many years ago when he sort of broached the idea that, look, you know, whether it's for C-17 or C-5, we need to start looking out into the future to figure out what are the attributes we need for a future lifter. Mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't even want to admit how long ago that conversation was, but at this point, you know, what are some of the things, you know, obviously we have a lot of counterinsurgency lessons, Absolutely. but now we're looking into the future where there are some peer-on-peer, -peer, mm -hmm. um, the Pacific the tyranny, the, the tyranny of range is a, is a very palpable thing in the, in the Pacific, where you see something like the C-5 does have the legs, whereas the C-17 is is tremendous airplane, was never designed for, for max range, was not one of its considerations, although in one of the iterations in a stretch, it could have had a little bit more range, but, you know, but that's a trade-off as well. But as you look at it, what are the kind of characteristics that, that need to be baked into what we need to look for in a future lifter? And I also then want to follow up because I have, a, I, have a, I have a tanker question as well. Okay. The things that I'm looking at right now, if, number one, I'm partnering with the industry. What is out there I don't even know? What are the things that I may like and say, hey, industry, you know, I read a lot of, uh, you know, the periodicals and I go, this is some really good stuff that industry is coming out for. What can I use? So you're talking about range and payload. We're getting ready to do a, a capabilities-based assessment that is going to not only look at tankers, but we're doing another one that's going to look at the future airlifter. Is it a common platform? Can, can a, whatever platform that creates the new tanker, is that compatible to be a new airlifter? Or we're looking at things for range, for payload, for distances, for support. Can it, does it need to land short field? Does it need to land uh, you know, on a, on a 12,000 foot runway? Can you have a common cockpit to where you and I are checked out in the same cockpit? We don't care the size behind us. We care about the mission for the day. So it's a common cockpit. They all start up the same. Does it have four motors or two motors? One day it may have four, one day it may have two. Maybe they all have two. So, and also I want to be informed by our joint users. They need to at least say, this is the weapon system that I need to have to be able to support the combat commander on the ground or in the air. And I need to be able to go, okay, I am informed by those requirements. Now what does that new airframe look like? I would like to be able to have an airplane that, number one, can communicate 
beyond line of sight securely, anytime, anywhere to be able to move adaptively around the, the battle space. I would like to have an aircraft that has a defensive type of systems on it, um, uh, the most modern defensive systems that I can, whether that's a, an airborne laser technology, which we're looking into right now, that's uh, not an offensive weapon, a defensive weapon. I want to use signature management. So as the zeros and ones come to the airplane, what does the signature management look like when it comes back out? What does the radar see? What does the IR spectrum see? What does, the, what does it see? Can I change that up with, with what we have in technology today? It's those things and also, like I said, range and payload. Because not only will we be offloading gas, but we're also obviously offload cargo. And we're also right now in the foreseeable foreseeable future we have to do airdrop so those things are always in the calculus those are just the tip of the iceberg what I'm looking at and um, from a smart tanker standpoint though I mean you're a big advocate for making sure that every one of those aircraft that's out there is a node is a relay Um, obviously that's something that General Jumper and Secretary Roach Mm -hmm. were talking about a long time ago but the challenge for that was money and how do you equip your whole force to turn this into a fully fused uh, nodal system do you have the kind of budget in order to be able to sustain that? In order to sustain it or in order to acquire it? Well, let's let's say to acquire it, right? Well, I mean, is, uh, What I'm going to do is work with industry and see what's out there. And then there again, program it out and work at using my rapid global mobility core functional lead and propose those to higher headquarters where we'll look at the requirements and see if the need is there. I think the need is. It's not, an, it's not collecting data or anything like that. It's just a pass-through of data. That's all it is. It's a node. So I think with working with the industry, we can get to where it's an affordable, that's an affordable apparatus we can put. Let me, um, let me ask you, uh, you started your career in C-130Es, uh, a legendary and venerable and capable airplane. Um, you know, C-130 has been a staple. We're obviously on the J model of the airplane now, uh, you know, but, but that aircraft is, is not exactly a spring chicken either, even though they are still rolling off the line and it's a very capable airplane. At some point, even though this is a terrific design, an, an almost an immortal design, mm-hmm. uh, a lot like a, a modern day DC-3, is that the right box size? Or is that something that even in your future airlift construct as you look at it, may need to be reconsidered? I think when we do our studies, we'll be well informed of what that box size, what that needs to be. I don't want to say it needs to be reconsidered because it offers certain advantage in a niche. It is a very good humanitarian relief type of platform. So is the C-17. It provides a direct, it provides a you know a direct delivery aspect that, that really benefits nations. Uh, austere landing capability that benefits nations. So it's a combination of tactical lift versus the stra- you know strategic lift versus the capabilities and offshoots that you can have of that aircraft. I just don't want to throw out my terms, but the baby with the bathwater. I want to be able to look at the combinations and look at what our assessments did and then become informed about what we need to do. But right now, it's a viable platform just as well as the rest of our fleet. I will tell you, when it comes to global mobility, nobody does it better than the United States of America. And I don't see an adversary being able to do it at all better than we can in, in the, out in the future. And it's because of the combinations we have and how we use our aircraft and how we train our folks and how we keep our aircraft maintained, that's what drives that calculus. Any interest in the A400M, which keeps surfacing every now and then, and you see a new story that the Air Force is interested in? Do you have any entry, any interest at all in that airplane? Frankly, right now, I don't have the budget to have interest in it right now. It's, it's not a matter of uh, the airplane is hugely capable. I just can't right. afford a new weapon system right now. So one of the things that we've been hearing from the Air Force leadership, obviously, is, look, the counterinsurgency fight is something that's important, and we're going to have to continue supporting it. But we also have to get ready for that very high-end state-on-state fight. We we heard from Hawk Carlisle. Obviously, this is his valedictory. But, you know, General Carlisle talked really eloquently about what the battle environment looks like, what are the advantages and the capabilities we have to develop. As the person who's in charge of, of the mobility piece of it, which is one of the discriminators of our way of war, along with space, but obviously precision strike, but certainly the ability to move industrial scale air power and tanking and everything else that's required to get folks downrange very quickly in, in, a, in, a, in a train. What are some of the intellectual changes that need to happen in AMC as this focus shifts from operating for decades and a decade and a half or more in a permissible environment to getting to your generation's mindset, which is 
hey, we're, we may have to be flying stuff into denied areas, taking much greater risk, getting shot at, getting shot down, but also being able to deliver even by taking greater risks. Is the, does the cultural shift have to happen in your command as well? Yeah, I, I think so, and it has to start with me. I will tell you, I did a future games exercise a couple of years ago, and I did exactly what you described. I laid out the, the logistics trail, and I did it the way I was trained way back in the 80s. The adversary has a vote in this exercise. They came up, they popped me, and guess what I lost? I don't like to lose. So I changed my, started changing my mindset. So I said, all right, I gotta be able to get there faster. I gotta be more adaptive. I gotta be more agile. And I've gotta get those at the, where they need that logistics trail, whether it's fuel or supplies or airborne insertion, it needs to get there as quickly as possible. How do I change my calculus to be able to do that? My team is working right now at tactics, techniques, and procedures, what we can do to modernize our aircraft, what we can do to change the signature, uh, uh, do signature management on with either sensors or uh, in defensive systems to be able to get us get closer to the fight, to be able to support the needs at the moment at the warfighter needs them, and then be able to reconstitute that, uh, reconstitute that aircraft survivability-wise to be able to get it to fight another day. That goes for our tankers. That goes for all our mobility air platforms. So now that's going to drive to our future studies too. Of going okay, what is out there that we can do those exact things? What is out there that we haven't thought about? This is stuff that's coming out of my head. This is stuff that's coming out of teams. Head. But what is in the future five years now and ten years down and now to, uh, from now to get after that? That's extremely important. Is it a shell game? Is it a guessing game? Yes, it is, because I don't know what I don't know. That's the reason why partnering up with the industry is so vitally important. Getting the message out, saying this is the things that we need to take a look at. Industry will come forward, and they'll say, Here's our, here's our proposal, take a look at it. That's vitally important, and that's going to help us get after this. General Dewey Everhart, Commander of the Air Mobility Command, sir, thanks very much for being so generous with your time. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. As always, it's great seeing you. Thank, Thank you. you, sir.